Hi, it's Mr. Ramage, and this lesson is going to teach you about the battle over the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles as the United States Senate takes on U.S. President Woodrow Wilson. Now, I'm assuming if you're watching this video, you've already learned a little bit about World War I and maybe even the Paris Peace Conference. But just to recap it a little bit, President Wilson travels to Paris representing the United States and brings with him his 14 points, one of them being the creation of a League of Nations, an international peace body that will try to prevent future wars. Wilson's 14 points are basically set aside by the big four members of Great Britain, France, and Italy as they look to secure and increase the size of their empires and create a harsh and terrible peace with Germany. So Wilson's League of Nations is one of the things, though, that does find its way into the final version of the Treaty of Versailles. And even though Wilson's not very happy with the treaty, he signs it anyway, believing that the League of Nations will help prevent future wars. Wilson said, I can predict with absolute certainty that within another generation, there will be another world war if the nations of the world do not concert the method by which to prevent it, meaning his League of Nations. Wilson returns to the United States with the signed treaty, and now the battle is going to begin. So in order to understand why there's going to be a bit of a fight about the treaty, we need to look back at our checks and balances of the United States Constitution. Now, the President of the United States has certain powers and responsibilities, and so does the United States Congress, specifically, in this case, the United States Senate. So, President Wilson can ask for a declaration of war, but back in 1917, remember, it was Congress that declares war on Germany and her allies. Now that the war is over, President Wilson can sign any treaty that he wants, but it is the United States Senate specifically which must approve all foreign treaties and do so with a two-thirds majority vote. President Wilson is going to have quite the battle because in 1918, the Republicans took control of the United States Senate, and they're already very upset with President Wilson because he did not take any U.S. senators with him to Paris. So there are three types of senators here looking at this treaty. Let's start with the internationalists. Now, these are the Senate Democrats who already support the treaty and will do so because they believe the president is right. We have the Irreconcilables. Now, these are 16 Republicans led by Senator William Bora, and they will vote no on this treaty no matter what. And then we have the Reservationists led by Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. The Reservationists will support the treaty, but they need to have some major amendments to the treaty made before they will cast a vote in support of it. Now, these three groups are going to go back and forth for a number of months as they debate and discuss this treaty. So what is the big problem with the Irreconcilables and what's the problem with the Reservationists? What do they want to change? Well, in the League of Nations Charter, there's this little thing called Article 10, which states that all member nations would support another League member in the event of an attack by another nation. And what this means is that as a member of the League of Nations, it is the League that would now decide where and when the United States went to war, no longer the United States Congress. This takes away the power and authority of the Congress and supersedes the U.S. Constitution. And this is something that the United States Senate will not allow. Senator William Boris said, we are told that this treaty means peace. Even so, I would not pay the price. Would you purchase peace at the cost of your independence? Senator Lodge said, I want to keep America as she has been, not isolated, not preventing her from joining other nations of these great purposes, but I wish her to be master of her fate. Now, Wilson argues that as a member of the League of Nations, the United States would have a great voice and a great say-so in where and when the League decided to support military actions. That the League was not designed to support military actions, but rather economic sanctions and boycotts of nations in order to get them to comply. Wilson has a lot of work to do in order to gain support for the ratification of his treaty, and especially for his League of Nations covenant. You can see him here in this political cartoon navigating the ratification rapids, and in his boat is the peace treaty and the League of Nations covenant. This cartoon pokes fun at the United States senators who see the dove of peace with his olive branch and his beak uh, as a horrible vulture that must be taken away. In this one, we see Senator Lodge and Senator Bora literally refusing to give up the seat to peace. 
Now arguing the other side, we see Uncle Sam about to get wed to some foreign entanglements until the United States Senate crashes through the window to interrupt the ceremony, clutching in its hand constitutional rights. Political cartoons are a great way to try to look to see uh, the attitudes and opinions of people at the time. So President Wilson decides that he's going to go to the American people. He's going to bring his case to the American people himself. And in September of 1919, launches a 22-day cross-country journey stretching 8,000 miles. Now, he did this against the wishes of his doctors, who believed he was not in the best of health, and this would be a bad idea. Wilson said, My own health is not to be considered when the future peace and security of the world are at stake. If the treaty is not ratified by the Senate, the war will have been fought in vain, and the world will be thrown into chaos. I promised our soldiers when I asked them to take up arms that it was a war to end wars. So Wilson goes on his trip and takes his case to the people, stating that either we should enter the league not fearing the role of leadership which we now enjoy, or we should retire from the great concert of powers by which the world was saved. Giving as much as three speeches a day, Wilson does begin to fall ill and on October 2nd, 1919, suffers a stroke and is taken back to Washington, D.C., where he is essentially incapacitated for the better part of two months. The debate over the treaty rages on while the president recuperates and eventually the vote comes in November of 1919. So let's recap the vote real quick. For the no side, the United States Senate said that the League's Article 10 will take away Congress's power to declare war. On the yes side, President Wilson argues that the United States as a member of the League will have a voice and a vote in terms of any time it would need to go to war. The Senate argues that other nations are going to influence U.S. policy. Wilson argues back the League will use economic sanctions before going to war. The U.S. will constantly be involved in European conflicts, the Senate says. Wilson says the U.S. needs to be a world leader in order to maintain peace. When the world needs our leadership. And the Senate argues America should be more isolated from other nations' problems. Wilson argues, why did we fight if not for peace? So on November 19, 1919, the treaty comes to a vote and is defeated by the Senate. It'll also come up for another vote in March of 1920, where the amended version of the treaty will also be defeated, where the New York Times reported the next day after the session ended, senators of both parties united in declaring that in their opinion, the treaty was now dead to stay dead. So Wilson is defeated in this battle over the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations. Now, the League of Nations will be formed. The United States will not be a member of the League of Nations and will go on to make a separate peace with Germany in 1921. But without the membership of the United States as a keystone of the League of Nations, the gap in the bridge will be significant. And it's without the membership of the League of Nations that the League will struggle in the 1930s especially to combat the rise of fascism in Italy, Germany, and Japan, and will fail to accomplish its goal of preventing a future world war. So some key takeaways from our lesson today. That in order for the treaty to be approved, it had to be ratified by the Senate. Republicans rejected the Senate, believing that it would entangle Americans in foreign wars and weaken their constitutional powers. Wilson argued in favor of the Treaty of the League as a way to maintain the peace won at the end of World War I and end wars for all time. But President Wilson was unwilling to compromise on his original vision for the League of Nations. He brought his argument to the people, touring the country before a stroke left him bedridden. The Senate voted to reject the treaty, and the United States will not join the League of Nations, and America would begin its movement toward a more isolationist policy in the 1920s. Hopefully this lesson taught you a little bit more about the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles, or the lack of ratification of the Treaty of Versailles. I'm glad you learned something. <laughs>